us now. We've got Play Behind the Bar and Miss McLeod's Reel. You might have heard them. as a village situated upon the river Dodder, and two and a half miles from the GPO on the road to Bray. The, road, the Dodder is spanned by Anglesey Bridge built in complement to a noble of that name while Viceroy in 1830. It is one of the three main rivers of Dublin along with the Liffey and the Tolka. The Dodder is 26 kilometres long. From the waterfall of the Dodder at Clonskey from the main bridge of Donnybrook Road, the river proceeds in a straight line for half a mile crooks. The flow is normally leisurely and of an average depth of 12 inch but when in flood 6 to 10 feet. The waterfall may be described as follows. A large head of water held by a mass of natural rock some 200 feet wide and 30 feet deep by 20 feet high at its highest. In normal times the water finds its way down by many small rivulets to the bottom Stop. of... Stop! This is boring. Facts, facts, facts. Somebody must have a story to tell. Something a bit more interesting. A personal story? Does anybody here have a story to tell? I have a personal story about 1916. Um, an expert of P.J. Lennon, a Donnybrook childhood in 1916. Come across the river and I'll tell you more. Hold on a minute, hold on a minute. I have a story too. I have a personal story from 1986 when I was experiencing Hurricane Charlie. I'll follow you across the river now and hear what you have to say. memoirs of uh, P.J. Lennon. Donnybrook Bridge was a search point from 1916 onwards. When there was an ambush or such like in the town, the army put a barrier across and search pedestrians and ve vehicles. The barrier was on Slorgan Road. In hindsight, it seems stupid, but they searched on the main bridge only and ignored the iron bridge. Though we children never found anything of military nature there, we picked up at least six revolvers, several cans of bullets from the river and beneath the bridge over the years, where apparently they had been dropped into the river before the search. These we played with and used to carefully hide away because on one occasion, one of our number found what appeared to be a leg of an armchair with a ring on the end of it. He was brandishing it off the rocks in the river to get the ring off. A tram conductor, uh, looking from the bridge, told him to stop and get away at once and proceeded to come down from the bridge and took the thing into the tram shed. He opened it and we observed by climbing the wall at Beaver Row uh, that contained it, that it contained a revolver. From then on, whatever we found was ours. And in about in or about 1922, a notice appeared on the board of the police station saying, "We believe that a reward would be given for all arms handed in." One day, we decided to collect what we had hidden away near the river, and at least six revolvers, one sword two bayonets and several uh, carbon cans filled with bullets. 
small, medium, and very large, about nine inches. Some, the medium bullets had uh, four had four cuts in the silver part. Having draped ourselves to make our equipment as obvious as possible, and with the revolver stuck in our braces, we marched to the police station. Much to the astonishment of the passers-by, when we arrived, we were ushered into a sparsely furnished room and told that the man who dealt with the rewards was out. Pending his return, a list of articles would be made in our name and addresses taken, so that if a reward was payable, they would let us know. The only thing that happened was that our names got around the village and my parents gave me a hiding for having such dangerous things. They never knew that many of the bullets had been spent on its way from beneath two large stones by striking the cap with a sharp small stone. Well, it was 1986. In fact, it was around this time. It was the 25th of August. 1986 and I've been living over in Beaver Row for about 10 years and it started to rain it was after Hurricane Charlie was coming this way and I had never seen so much rain in fact it rained so much that they told us later that in 24 hours all of the rain fell for the entire month of August which was pretty shocking but what was more shocking to me was my friend who said come look at the footbridge and he dragged me down to this bridge and he started dancing on the bridge. I got very scared. But why did I get so scared? Because he was dancing on the bridge? Because the river was roaring over his feet. And I said, for God's sake, that bridge was built in 1880. You gotta get off it now. And we left the bridge, went back to the house for relative safety. But about 10 o'clock that night, the car that came to the door pounded on the door and said, you gotta get out of here. You gotta get out of here now. And he said, why? He said, because the river's going to be six feet high in your kitchen by 4 a.m. There's a bus down at the bus garage that's evacuating people. So at that stage, I was alone with my two-year-old daughter. I picked her over my hip. I left the house. First, I looked around and said goodbye to everything I know. But people do when they're told the bus to be six feet high in their kitchen. And said goodbye to everything and quickly and took my daughter on my hip. And this was getting really scary. The water was almost up to my knees and I didn't know if it was going to get higher or, you know, as in a flood, you just don't know. And I've never been in a flood. So we walked up to the bus garage. There was nobody else around. To our great disappointment, the bus had already gone. So I stood there, water up to my knees, daughter on my hip, and a miracle happened. The bus driver came out of the garage and said, you've missed the bus. I said, we gathered that. He said, never mind, stop in. I'll bring you somewhere. So he put me and my daughter, the only ones on the bus, and we couldn't get across the river, so there was no question of going into town. So we brought us out to Terra Towers, where we spent the night in the lounge. An 85-year-old neighbor of mine, whom I convinced that she had to go, was there, very annoyed at having had to leave her house, Miss Annie Farrell. But she was okay. She probably would be okay, because we found out later that the water rose to the doors and then drifted down to Falls Bridge and flooded the people there. So we lucked out. But that morning, the morning after the flood, took my daughter to daycare, went to work. And my boss said, you know, you're 10 minutes late. And I said, well, it was the flood last night. There was the water. There was walking in the water. There was sleeping in the tower towers on the floor. And she said, I never heard anything about a flood in Dublin. That's my story. <laughs> Over the years, a lot of people have written poetry. And this event is partly about poetry. Have we got any poets here? people that write poetry. I'm sure we do. Um, well, I'm going to read you a couple of poems. The first one is, and then we'll have some more music. The first poem is from the 7th of August, 1932. And the Sunday Independent awarded first prize to W. Swain Little for what he wrote for his poem called The Daughter Water. So I'm going to read you this poem. You may like it, you may not, but it's an, it's an artifact of the past and the daughter. The Daughter Water. It bends, it curves, and winds its way from Dublin Hills to Dublin Bay, bubbling, troubling as it roves uh, down the hill from day to day by bowered bank and sylvan groves. It gurgles on its rapid way, restless, dreaming as it flows, of bygone times and brilliant glows, to so the amorous daughter strays, reaching to kiss the sun's warm rays, purling, curling, gliding through midday sun and evening dew, 
the daughter river, dear to all, nature lovers who can see the wistful beauty found in thee. And from your bosom hear a call of phantoms pale of old renown, who once strolled here from Dublin town, Goldsmith, Pratton, Hearn, and Burke, by thee found solace from their work, and other lights of feebler glow, watch from the bridge your sleepless flow, as bending, winding to the bay, filtering through the shingle stack, its sightless rushes on its way, whirling, curling through the dark. Now, a second poem by a more renowned poet, um, Austin Clark, who lived on the daughter and was born 1896 to 1974. He lived in a house below Temple Oak Bridge, but sadly that house is now demolished. But his poems are with us still, so I'm going to read you a short poem by him called On a Bright Morning. It's a very different poem. A blackbird sat on a sunspot, warming his wings. Down by the bridge, flying from our elm, that pigeon had slowly got himself into hot water. Along the garden walk, the scattered crumbs still lay. Up in a pine, magpie was talking too much. I whistled in vain, for the sparrows, after a dust bath under the rosebuds, had gone on a holiday to the river bend. I saw them play a game of shall we? Yes, let's, beside the swallows then feather the drops to spray. Thank you very much, and I'd like to introduce to you Jason McDonald. where the bark jutted inwards. These we used as grips and steps at about 10 foot. So we were at one time, two large branches at the larger were, would have pointed towards the parochial hall, which was there, and had fallen away, leaving a gaping hole. And the other branch pointed to Harmony Villas, and which is still in position. And to our delight, uh, was only a, a matter of inches away from telephone wires. So we promptly attached a cocoa tin. Uh, we were, had already made a floor complete with a trap door up to six foot up the tree using uh, in-growing irregularities to, of the bark as a foundation. Thus we had a room with a phone and a window overlooking the river, curtained by a sack. We used candles for lighting. I was an altar boy, and using, um, I used to help the clerk to close the church and before finally locking up. And the candles on the shrines were distinguished 
and thrown into a waste holder. Some, however, were re uh, retrieved, and I justified myself by saying that they were going to be thrown away anyway. During the curfew period, everybody uh, except those essential workers with passes were to be indoors by 8 to 4 or 9 p.m. And a searchlight was on top of the armored car that would be seen when uh, the patrol was at Montrose, Major Kelly's residence, now RTE. The site, of the, the site of the searchlight was turned about and was a queue to go indoors, everybody's house, until the patrol had passed. It is hardly believable now, but the rattle of the pounding of the solid tired lorries on the patrol gave a warning of its approach. Sometimes the patrol came down from Roebuck via Beach Hill and Beaver Road, and on such occasion we were playing cards in the hollow of the tree and forgot about the curfew and nearly lost our lives. Suddenly a ray of light played on the, through the sackcloth and at the same time a bayonet tore away the sack and we were commanded to surrender. An Irish engineer complains of injustice. So June 6th, 1851, Freeman's Journal. As one of the engineers and iron founders who signed a public complaint, I want to tell you about the unjust and unfair decision the Dublin and Kingstown Railway Company lately made in relation to designs and tenders for the job of constructing a bridge to carry their line across the River Dollar. As I speak, this bridge is now being built by Messrs Fairburn of Manchester, but for a chance rumour that one of our firms heard that Messrs Fairburn had been consulted on this work, I firmly believe that no Irish firm would have had any opportunity so much as to make an offer for its execution. As it was, Fairburn had already had more than a month when just 10 days was given to Irish engineers to prepare their designs and tenders. One Irish firm, John and Robert Mallet of Dublin, offered two tenders, one to construct their bridge from their own design and one upon the plan of Fairburn's box girders. Both offers were considerably lower than any other offers and they voluntarily undertook to maintain the structure for 12 months from erection of the bridge. We understand the chief engineer of the railway company approved and strongly recommended this tender be adopted and the model of it is stated to have struck the members of the board very much. Yet these tenders were rejected. By what influence or bias? How such an unjust decision to give it to strangers was made, it is not for us to discuss. This bridge has, mere, has a mere 60 foot span. Every one of our Irish firms has executed similar work of greater magnitude and importance. For instance, the King's Bridge bridges over the Shannon and the Lattice Viaduct across the Royal Canal at Dublin, to name just a few. We are all large contributors to the taxation and the support of the poor in Ireland. Many thousands of individuals are dependent on the employment given in our, retros in our respective works for their daily bread. We support free trade, but are not prepared to sustain without re remonstrance. A bias and preference towards strangers that pretends to be fair competition, but clearly is not. We lay this before the public, certain that sooner or later they will condemn that which is unjust and unpatriotic and compelled by United's opinion that which is due to our native industry. Scene 20, Freeman's Journal. Floraville for sale. There once stood the house, Floraville, to be sold at auction on the premises this day, Monday, May 29, 1820, at one o'clock. The house, which is beautifully situated on the River Dodder between the villages of Donnybrook and Clonski, with an entrance from each and possesses many local advantages, which can only be known by inspection. There are two and a half acres of ground laid out in fruit and flower gardens, elegantly stocked, lawn, shrubbery, etc., well enclosed and a very neat lodge. There are three greenhouses, a vinery and a blowhouse. 
The house and offices are in perfect repair, having been built within the last three years and finished in the best manner with every convenience. It has been occupied about 18 months to be seen every day except Sunday from 10 until 4 o'clock. John Cook, auctioneer. I want that house. <laughs> now, I'd like to introduce to you again, well, for the first time actually, Catherine Ann Cullen, who, with very short notice, has composed two remarkable original songs about the daughter. And you are our guinea pigs. You're the first people to hear it. And it's, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> So this is a song called A Donder on the Dodder. It's a, a partly nor northern heritage, so donder means a walk or a little wander. And uh, thank you to my daughter Stella for the blue, shiny, rivery eye makeup that she just applied <laughs> on the bridge. <laughs> there were wakes of rivers flowing through the town I call my own. And I'd poke by the talka, and I'd chinny by the swan. Oh, I'd gargle on the dargle. On the dell when I would dance, and I'd paddle in the paddle all the way to Harold's Cross. Though the lippy can be whiffy, I would never hold my nose. But I found her of a donder where the Dodder River flows. From high up the pure with Tampa Shore to Glenis Mole she goes. Folks in town swear she stops for shopping in the square. From her house to Ralph Barnum, down to Temple Oak for tea. And it's not far to reach Rockgar and Milltown and Klonsky. Through Donnybrook and Ballsbridge to the Grand Canal she goes. You can ponder as you wander where the Daughter River flows. Ribbon loosely raveling across South Dublin town. She's a glistering of silver and a turbulence of brown. Lamenting for her sisters, the puddle and the swan. We've been swallowed up in concrete coats for many miles along. But she's proudly swimming naked in the way that nature chose. So I'd rather have a donder where the daughter river flows. Where the otter likes to potter, where the heron loves to pose. I'm fonder of a dander, where the daughter river flows. Thank you. There have been many uh, drownings over the centuries, suicides and rescues and murder. In the Evening Herald of May 7th, 1945, it was reported that a body of a young girl, about 20 years old, dressed in night attire only, was taken from the daughter. And in December 1920, in December 22nd, 1930, an inquest was held into the death of an unknown child found in the river, concluded that the death was due to lack of skilled attention at birth. November 10th, 1936, Belfast News Letter. Disappearance of a Dublin teacher, police still dragging river daughter. Dublin police and detectives were busy yesterday continuing further searches along the river daughter for Jane Annette Leslie, the 33 year old Dublin school teacher who mysteriously disappeared on Friday evening last after leaving a friend at the Royal City of Dublin Hospital. Boats were used by the detectives and police in their intensive combing of the river, but no clue has been found. Shortly after her disappearance, Miss Leslie's motor car was found in Orwell Park Road near the river. The switch key was removed and the lights turned off. Under the front left seat was a purse containing some money, a garage key, driver's license, and some other papers, for which it is surmised that Miss Leslie intended to return. 
Sadly, her body was discovered in the Dodder on the 24th of November. A crowd of over a hundred people witnessed the recovery and the body was taken to London Bridge Wharf. Drownings and also rescues. A man 80 rescued. An eight-year-old man was rescued from drowning at the River Dodder at Ring's End yesterday. This was uh, June 16, uh, 1956. On the port of the docks, board a ferry kept him afloat nearly for 10 minutes with a boat hook. He was discharged from hospital after some treatment. 26th of August, 1857, Irish Examiner. Attempted suicide. Yesterday, between 12 and one o'clock, a female of highly respectable appearance, when passing over London Bridge, was seen to stop suddenly and throw herself over the parapet into the River Dodder. The Reverend J. Coughlin of Edinburgh, who fortunately was near enough to render assistance, plunged into the river in his clothes and at the imminent risk of his own life succeeded in bringing the unfortunate lady to the shore. She was so exhausted that she had to be carried to Bagot Street Hospital where every attention was paid to her. She at first refused to give her name or tell where she resided but subsequently she stated that her name was Elizabeth Ellis and that she resided at Sandy Mount. It stated that her mind had been affected in consequence of some recent reverses of fortune. of June 1963, Irish Press. Boy rescued from river by neighbour. A 14-year-old Dublin boy who nearly drowned in the River Dodder yesterday evening because his friends failed to realise he was in difficulties was saved by a neighbour who jumped a 10-foot high wall to pull him out of the water. The boy, Colm Hankey, Beach Hill Drive, Donnybrook, was floating face downwards with arms outstretched when Mr George Hutchison, Beach Hill, Crescent, jumped in. When he brought him out, he immediately applied artificial respiration and after some time, the boy regained consciousness. Last night, Mr Hutchison an employee of the Department of Post and Telegraphs, Pierce Street, said, I was walking along the bank of the Dodder with my wife and family between Klonsky and Milltown Bridge when I noticed about 10 boys on the bank opposite one of them was in the water and then a second boy went in. Garda hero of a rescue. A young Garda saved a woman in her early 30s from drowning last night when he jumped into the River Dodder at near Ashton's pub in Klonski. He has got a John Crowley, 21, of Donnybrook Station and only recently out of training. That happened in October 27th, 1986 and it was reported in the Irish press. Now, luckily, in going through the archives, I didn't find too many murders, but there was one that struck me. In March 2nd, 1841, the body of a young Italian organ player, Dominic Garibald, was found on the banks of the daughter at Rathfarnham. He clearly had been severely injured. He was last seen that night playing his organ in Rathmines. He was fully clothed, but a money pouch which was carefully hidden on his person was missing. His companions were suspected, as only they would have known about the existence and location of the money pouch. Floods and pollution. Floods. A flood on the Dodder in March 1628 claimed the life of Arthur Usher, deputy clerk to the Privy Council of Ireland, who was carried away by the current, nobody being able to succour him, although many persons, his nearest friends, were by on both sides. The two greatest Dodder floods before 1986 occurred on 25th of August 1905 and on 3rd and 4th of August 1931. August 3rd, 1839. The flood in the River Donner rose to such a height that it overflowed the wooden bridge of Serpentine Avenue upon which the railroad traverses. October 3rd, 1858, Irish Examiner. The tremendous floods in the River Donner have done much damage to the walls and land at each side of it. 
The water rose so high at the weir below Raffarnham Bridge as to overflow the mill pond and drive a massive wall in upon the river that completely flooded the opposite banks. The weir near the end near the road at Rockgar is also flooded and the little cottage adjoining it only escaped being carried away by the flood. The inmates were aroused out of their beds by the roar of winds and waters and were obliged to fly for their lives, at least fly to avoid a dangerous inundation. The water had rushed into the garden in front of the cottage and the poor people were at a late hour of the night compelled to drag their children through it and put up with the best accommodation for them and themselves which the neighbourhood could afford. The waterfalls of both weirs are highly picturesque and worth an hour's ramble. 10th of September 1840. Citizens whose homes were flooded as they believed due to works by the railroad were urged by the company to give up their compensation claims in return for future preventative works. It was pointed out that poor people could not afford to give up their claims. Fish kills. Time and time again, pollutants deliberately or accidentally dumped into the dodder killed thousands upon thousands of fish. Poisons entering the river anywhere could kill uh, off every living thing downstream. An example, August 17th, 1854. The case of the corporation versus Batters and Bourne was being heard. The latter had polluted the dodder at Old Bawn in Tala by suffering to be turned into great quantities of filthy, noxious liquor produced by the making of paper. This rendered the water of the dodder deleterious and unfit for consumption. The corporation, being themselves men engaged in trade, naturally felt great reluctance to do anything which would have the appearance of obstructing the trade or industry of the country. But that was no reason why the public health should be endangered. The corporation proposed that for a trifling expenditure or inconvenience, the noxious ingredient could be easily carried off in another direction. But for some reason or other, this prudent and proper course was abandoned and the company preferred to come before them and insist upon it that they had a right to inject the river dodder with these ingredients. January 29th, 1953, thousands of dead trout were seen. June 25th, 1956, industrial pollution again kills thousands of fish. August, 1988, Dublin Corporation was accused of misdirecting a pipe into the Dodder which caused the death of over 18,000 fish. However, the judge in the case decreed that it was an act of God and charges against the corporation were dismissed. On one occasion, Local people rushed down to the Dodder with buckets of fresh water and tried to save the fish on the banks, but it was to no avail. Thanks to the efforts of the Dodder Anglers Association, Dodder Action and many volunteers, the river is much cleaner today, but we have to be vigilant to keep it that way.
of poems, three poems, three short poems by uh, Jean O'Brien, who is a friend of mine and a well-known poet in Dublin. And uh, she grew up around uh, the daughter in Milltown. And uh, she had some sort of very tragic uh, circumstances in her life. Her mother took her own life when Jean was still a child. So um, some of these poems refer to that in, a, in, a, in an oblique kind of way. So the first poem is called A Place of Safety. Summer always meant trouble. Our mother brooding in the bed at midday. Our ears too finely turned knew the precise pitch when a sob would turn to rage. We held our childhood in the breath of the Dodder River bed. Shallow water safe as we waded in. Jam jars hung with twine to lay along the silt and shale and await the shoals of tadpoles. Success. In the murky jar a few were caught, worn carefully home to be placed in bowls a stone strategically positioned for when the prisoners grew legs and needed air. As I walk now along the yard width of pebbles we call the beach, I feel as if I spent whole summers here. So that's a place of safety. Can you hear me? I'm, yeah, sorry. Okay, I'll just get a bit closer there. Uh, and this is a, a kind of a one where she refers to uh, the historic kind of situation of people walking um, from the, along the Dodder during the famine. It's called a show of frost, 1847. Following the river, I trace the ancient pathway those other people walked on the grounds of the old morgue, working their way into the city from the hungry hinterlands to die beside the gurgling river, their bodies on the grass, or floated downstream. Late September, shiny chestnuts split their skins and lie among the first fall of leaves. Nettles and cow parsley rot after a sudden show of frost. Blackberries slowly ripen. Too soon yet to eat, they are bitter on the tongue. Bitter too for those people, this sight of Milltown with the river flowing under Classen's Bridge. The lie of the land shifts by river water mica sparkles, granite headstones flat on the riverbed. I walk here a trick of history. Those people travel with me, footsteps in my head. And the third poem is called Winter Resolved. All winter I walked the river bank, searching for the familiar gray of the heron. I had watched him through two summers and winters. All winter I was caught between the calls of my new child and my dying father, stretched to my limits, trapped midway between the pull of youth and age as they seemed to sound each other out through the sleepless nights, both struggling to keep their foothold. As my daughter's coos and cries grew louder, my father's frets and murmurs quietened. I heard her drowning him out. Now, with the first hints of spring, I find my heron. He stands stock still on his, high, on his high legs above the waterfall, no quiver betraying his efforts to keep balance. Thank you. The next poem is by our own local poet, that probably people don't know he's a poet, Dermot Lacey who uh, gave us permission to read it today. And he wrote it and didn't know what to do with it, so this is what he decided to do with it after years. Mm -hmm. The Daughter by Dermot Lacey. From Dublin's mountains tumbling through the fields and villages that we all knew, through Talla, Bushy and Dartry parks, where the children play and their laughter sparks. Then moving on up the hill where Martin Murphy parked his trams, See parents walking with their children, little babies in their prams. The hippo standing proud midstream, just before the dropping well. The stories that were shared once there, oh, I wish them I could tell. Like all directions in this land, go on past Scully's field and head on to Clonsky House before the junction yields. Enjoy there a pint or two before you head on uh, uh, head out on your way and remember that great publican Tipperary's Jim O'Shea 
Then on past the low river and the view from the bridge, from Brookvale Road to Beaver Row, simple memorial on the edge, recalling all the times he crossed in memory of Lord Mayor Joe, a plaque some day on the other side to whom you never know. Then moving on in dark brown skim, sometimes even green, the rats below are hideous, sometimes even seen. Pass by them the old mill race, it's long since closed down, that once helped Johnson, Mooney and O'Brien make the bread for Dublin town. Then moving on through Herbert Park, where the international fair was hosted by Lord Pembroke, Queen Alexandra called in there. It's where we spent our childhood times, joyfully playing on swings, our times gone by when we had fun with such old fashioned, innocent things. Crossing now Anglesey Bridge to the Dodder View. Yes, more of these great Pembroke cottages are right in front of you. With the new high wall the Corpo built for flood protection measures, safe now for the residents, but blocking the river's treasures. Continue on through the arch, separating foot from rail, on then to Aviva or Lansdowne Road in this old tale. Then on by higher water and the new low bridge, Marion College on the left, another heron on river's edge. Now view the three young ducks swimming across the flow, right beside the fourth port scouts whose seamanship skills are all on show. As we come to Ring's End or Raytown of old, it's a common, it's a common a community whose richness all Dubliners behold. Down the steps, it's high water now at the Grand Canal Bridge Walk, as we hear voices of new residents and the good old locals talk. We're at the end of this gentle stroll where all three streams collide. Dodder, Basin and Grand Canal meet the swirling Dublin Bay tide. So here's to our river Dodder, childhood playground of mine, always in my memory, always on my mind. Memories of my dad wheeling sand from the waterfall. Memories, dreams and families. Yes, that's life after all. But of all those special places, the one I love the best is just down by the waterfall, just past Ashton's House of Rest. Replaying times of river rafts and gently throwing stones who now, as scouts would put it, have simply gone home. The notion makes me shiver. For these three things I'd stipulate. A lake, a hill, a river. Your dull, flat, woody parks may be baronialer and broader. A glen for me, twixt hills and sea, with a live stream like daughter. Too long have I thy neighbour been, dear stream, without exploring thy course amid the meadows green, thy purling and thy roaring. For thou too, placid stream, hast roared, while in wild wintry weather thou hast thy mountain torrent poured between the crack, crags and heather. Thy mountain cradles far away, thy race is run, and mine is near perhaps. Ah, who can say how near? unto its finish. And so from life's loud dusty road, a somewhat jaded plotter, I steal to this serene abode, and thee, suburban daughter. I lean me on this orchard wall, and sniff the pears and cherries. Each shrub and tree, both great and small, stoops beneath its load of berries. That red rest, feeding yonder, see, poor innocent marauder, the seventh commandment finds not thee, a robin near the daughter. And now our seaward ramble meets a rustic, quaint, and still town, which you must spell with double L, God bless it, dear old Milltown. Yet even here one likes to dine, rich scenery's poor fodder, for poet going up the Rhine, or going down the daughter. 
My song must cease to find those songs by musical meek murmur. Broke nature's silence, age is gone. Thy voice has grown but firmer. In shade and shine, brave gap, brave gay, sing on, and scoop thy channel broader. From dawn to dark, from dark to dawn, flow on, sing on, O oh daughter. Flow on, pour more once warbled here. Flow on, thou shining river. Thy race is run, the sea is near. My muse grows sad, forgive her. And as we've strown upon their banks, our very softest sarder, flash bust back thy sunniest smile and thanks upon thy laureate, daughter. I leave thee, shall it be for I, a river's long forever? I will return, you often say, and yet return, ah, never. Well, on life's road, to dust or flowers, a not less useful plotter I'll be, please God, for these calm hours spent on the banks of Dublin. So now we're going to have the second original daughter song <laughs> by Catherine Ann Cullen, and it is called, appropriately, Listen to the River. Okay, I'll just say what we're doing. After this song, we're going to be walking up the path, but I want us to do this in a very special way. After we hear the song about listening to the river, I want us to focus on our connection with nature, our feet on the path, the sound of the river. So I'm asking you to walk in single file after this song until you get to the steps at the weir, where you will have a ceremony, blessing the daughter and more of everything, okay? The daughter rises in the hills of Dublin From Borna Brina you can hear her bubbling If peace you want, the daughter will deliver So dream a while and listen to the river The heron stands a solitary hunter a meditator on the water's wonder Still as a stone Until he feels the quiver To catch the trout He listens to the river Sometimes a trickler and sometimes a pourer but when rain swell and flutter, she's a roarer. Then all along her banks, the cottage livers must leave their homes and listen to the river. The otter shy and secret in her home. She wears the river's sheen upon her coat From dawn or dust to forage she'll endeavor For frogs and fish she listens to the river Your dreams will ride her ripples like the swallow where the river winds, your dream will follow. They open to the sea and fill the river. So I can go and listen to the river. Thank you. I come from down in the valley where Mr. and William they bring you what to do just like your daddy done. Me and Mary we met in high school when she was just 17. We ride out at 
that valley down to where the fields were green we go down to the river and into the river we dive well down to the river we drive then i got mary pregnant and man that was all she wrote for my 19th birthday, I got a union card and a wedding coat. We went down to the courthouse, and the judge put it all to rest. No wedding day smiles, no walk down the aisles, no flowers, no wedding dress. The night we went down to the river, and into the river we diverged down to Sends me down to the river, the river is dry. Well, down to the river tonight. I Did you guys think that was Japanese? No. Really? That's good. Well, it was Japanese. But anyway, uh, happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Glenda, for inviting all of us and getting all of us together at the Daughter River. I really enjoy <coughs> this time that we can all spend together. I'm living in Donegal. I've been living in Ireland about six years. I'm a Choctaw Indian from Oklahoma. And uh, Glenda invited me to come down and be part of this. Just very quickly, the Choctaw people were one of many, many people who donated money to uh, buy food to help people uh, during uh, Anguilta Moor, the great hunger or the great famine in Ireland. And so I suppose that's my connection here. Uh, very uh, tenuous. Goes back to 1847, though. That was the year of the Choctaw donation to to uh, Ireland. So then we're going to go down this way to where that little beach is at the end. And I'm going to take that tobacco out of this pouch and I'm going to give it to the waters as a prayer. And so I'm going to begin that prayer from up here and pass this buckskin pouch and I'll ask one of you for it when we get over there. After that, a few of us are going to dance. Glenda requested that, so maybe that's a bit of a performance, I don't know. It's a Choctaw dance, and uh, it's called a drink water dance. And that particular dance came to us along with those songs. When we were on a journey, they said one time, the people were dying of thirst, and they followed the white cranes to where there was water. And after they uh, revived themselves with the water, these cranes appeared again and gave them these songs. So we're going to do this uh, very simple dance, the drink water dance down there.
Thank you.